Good evening. I'm John Sepulveda, and you are at the World Affairs Council, and we are with Rick Wartsman. He is the senior advisor, or one of the uh, participants, or he, I should say he is with the Drucker Institute. Uh, he's a graduate of Claremont, and he has written a book called The End of Loyalty, The Rise and Fall of Good Jobs in America. Please welcome Rick to San Francisco. So I just want to start with the title, The End of Loyalty. That suggests that there's some type of social compact. Uh, describe a little bit what you mean by that title before we get into some of the more specific things you bring up in the book. Sure. So uh, The End of Loyalty, um, the term loyalty was used quite a lot um, in the post-war kind of golden age, if you will, um, uh, when big corporations uh, created huge numbers of jobs, uh, needed to create huge numbers of jobs for all the returning servicemen coming home from the war. Um, and they spoke very explicitly, the CEOs of these companies, uh, about loyalty and an expectation of loyalty that they would provide um, as employer, uh, as employers, and in return expecting uh, diligence and, and hard work and loyalty from their employee. And, and in doing so, they created a a real social contract, which I describe uh, in terms of, of really concrete things. So job security, good pay, uh, company provided health care benefits, which rose tremendously through this post-war kind of 30-year period, uh, and pensions, uh, retirement security, and, and really guaranteed pensions uh, in those days. So all those things rose in this kind of 30-year period from the late 40s to the early 70s. Now, Rick, before this uh, explosion of loyalty, if you will, did such a contract, did such a compact exist in America? Was that something that was um, focused on? Uh, not so much. Um, uh, you know, there, there were, and I, I talk about this. So my book, um, I tell this story through the lens of four big companies, um, four iconic companies. Uh, General Motors, General Electric, Kodak, and Coca-Cola. Um, they're all a little bit different um, in sort of how the social contract evolved and then how ultimately it was kind of uh, torn apart. Um, uh, they, and, and they were all a little different in their history. But in some cases, um, even by the sort of the teens, the 20s, um, uh, they were building toward this model. Um, the Depression often put some of that on hold, and they had to pull back uh, on some of the pay and perks that they were lavishing on employees. Um, uh, but it really all did accelerate in this post-war period. And the other ingredient was that unions uh, greatly strengthened in many of these places, and that helped the social contract be forged and accelerate. So it sounds like it, uh, there at least was a correlation between the rise of mass production and industrialization and the social contract. Um, yeah, there was. And I mean, one really interesting example uh, is, yeah, and before that, remember, there were a lot of artisans, right. a lot of actually um, big companies would contract out uh, for pieces to be made and brought in. And all of this would change by kind of the early 20th century. And then as we moved into more of an industrial economy, um, uh, it, it, the social contract began to be forged. I, in those earlier years, there was more of a drive system in factories where workers were often kind of pushed on in the hardest ways. That didn't completely ebb by any means. Factory jobs were pretty brutal all the way through this period. But, but again, largely because of organized labor, some of that did lessen a little bit and pay and perks rose. So what was the need for loyalty? Uh, I imagine that if the company is offering this and they're demanding it, there is some economic benefit to the company for the workers to be loyal. Uh, you, you mentioned pensions, for example. Pensions are a relatively new idea um, mm -hmm. economically. Why was it important to keep people long enough for them to uh, accrue a pension? So, you know, companies wanted stability. Um, and that was something that in a world, um, particularly after World War II, uh, where US corporations, you know, we as a country had effectively bombed our global competition to its knees. And so US companies were, uh, really had a, a kind of a, a, the world market that it owned. It could afford to be very generous. Um, and so uh, there was an expectation that people would work for a company for a long time. Things were just a lot more stable than certainly they were by the early 70s. 
um, when you began to see much more churn through through the system. So that was that was certainly part of it. Now you mentioned uh, that you look at this uh, through the lens of four companies, and we're mm -hmm. going to talk about those companies. But just briefly, before I leave the title, you say the rise and fall of good jobs in America. Mm -hmm. What exactly is a good job? So I think a good job is one with um, a wage you can live on um, and provide for a family on, ideally, um, you know, depending where you are in your sort of life cycle. Uh, it's one that um, uh, the working conditions are, are fair and, and decent. Um, and it's a job that you have some measure of fulfillment and dignity in, ideally. Um, I, I would think all of those are, are really important. And, and look, plenty of us I hope you, I certainly have a good job. So when I say the fall of good jobs, it is not that there are no good jobs left. You have a, you have a good job. You have a great job. So do I. I do. But there are fewer and fewer paths for many people to a good job. And that's really what the subtitle gets at. And certainly there are fewer paths. I just had the pleasure of talking to a group of high school students about this. For those who don't have uh, enough education or the right skills to make it in this new knowledge age. Used to be you could walk into one of these factories, a GM factory. Um, a lot of my research, I, I found some really interesting uh, interview notes that were, were done by a group of uh, management professors and sociologists from Yale in the 1950s. And, and they were the raw interview notes with frontline workers from uh, GM factories in um, Linden, New Jersey and Framingham, Massachusetts. And they're really fascinating to see these workers' voices, really what the work was like. And it was brutal. It was hard work. Um, it, it was draining of really body and soul in many ways. But it was also work that provided for people's families, gave them good health care benefits, it provided retirement security. They could make a decent living at it. And the striking thing as I looked through the profiles of all these people, because they would have their name and their marital status and what their hometown was and that sort of thing, their education level over and over again, eighth grade, sixth grade, maybe high school, um, you didn't need a lot of education to really make it. And that has very much changed. Formalized education. Correct. Uh, and you gave a great example of what constitutes a good job. Uh, what would be an example of a good job from this time period, from the late 30s to the to recent? Well, again, I, you know, the big shift, so, so largely what I'm referring to are these jobs that were sort of um, – middle wage, good, solid, middle class jobs. But what would that look like? Like, are we talking janitor, school teacher? No, it w well, certainly school teachers. Again, I, you know, as told through the lens of these four companies, it was a lot of factory work. Um, so whether it was at a Coca-Cola bottling plant, where again, you didn't need much education, you could start out. A lot of these were kind of franchisees. They were family-owned operations. Coke has sometimes owned its bottling operations, or some of them, and sometimes they're independent, but they're part of the Coca-Cola system. Again, you didn't need uh, to have much education. You could land a job as a truck driver, a route salesman, and work your way up and manage a whole factory at some point. Those paths disappeared by the 1980s. Same thing, you know, for uh, obviously there are still factory jobs at General Motors, but you need some skills training now. You probably need a technical certificate of some kind, if not a community college degree or beyond. Um, and there are just far, far fewer jobs than there certainly were um, at its height. Well, let's talk about some of these, these companies. Kodak, the first one thing that jumps to my mind is uh, this last uh, Thanksgiving, I was in Syracuse, New York. And of course, that's not the, the home of Kodak, but it's nearby. And um, I was really struck that at the Urban Outfitters, yes, I went to the Urban <laughs> Outfitters, um, if you couldn't tell by the flannel, um, <laughs> I, I, they had these Polaroid knockoffs, hmm. um, which of course Kodak made the Polaroid very, very famous. And this idea that there was like this retro kind of sentimentality attached to these instant cameras. Right. And I thought, those poor bastards at Kodak, like they were so close to being caught up in a hipster revival. Um, <laughs> it, it, my, my bigger point to this is that there was a, Kodak built the upper New York area. I mean, that company, either through the copier machines, the, uh, uh, through photography, uh, through other duplication methods, they really provided not just uh, for the individual workers, but also for 
the town in general. I mean, the whole infrastructure oh, sure. of the town was built yeah. well, Rochester, around Rochester. Absolutely, that, that it was a company town that does not exist anymore. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there are probably places that still feel like company towns um, in, but, in America. But Kodak is not the same oh, at all. Kodak's no, yeah. a shadow of itself. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I actually use Kodak. Um, my book starts in 1943 with the founding of an organization called the Committee for Economic Development. It's still around. It's actually part of the conference board now. But it was a leading business voice at the time. And it's hard like to think. Like a lobbying group? Well, no. It was more a public policy group. Mm. Um, and it was a group of, of uh, uh, executives, chief executives mostly, um, who were trying to steer the nation's post-war economy to create enough good jobs for all these returning service people. It was driven, their, their motives, they were driven by a mix of impulses. Um, there was, uh, for one, fear that if they didn't provide enough good jobs for all these returning folks, that there'd be another depression, maybe worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s, and that then communism or socialism uh, might take root on American soil. So there was fear of that. There was, part of their impulse was, um, to put enough money in people's pockets, this very kind of Keynesian economic idea that people need money in their pockets to be able to spend as consumers to fuel the economy. And they're actually economists now worried, they call it secular stagnation, that uh, so many people are low-wage workers that really don't have enough consumer power that it's just kind of choking economic growth. So that, that was a concern. Um, so I start, I start, and in some cases, like Kodak, they wanted to provide good pay and, and benefits to fend off unions in their case. And Kodak was never organized. It was the one company in the book never organized. So there was a mix of impulses. But there was also part of um, the, the story is that um, corporations then reflected, I think, very different cultural norms. Um, remember, as America, we had just come out of the Depression, out of World War II, and there was definitely, you listen to the way CEOs talked, there was much more of a we mentality. Um, we have shifted to an I mentality, to an I ethic. We have lost that sensibility. And corporations then both, I think, reflected and reinforced those larger cultural norms. So let me, let me take one more second, which is, so the book starts there. The four companies that I use to tell this larger story GM, GE, Kodak, Coca-Cola, were all instrumental in the founding of the Committee for Economic Development. And I then, uh, and so I start with their business leaders in the room forging this vision for what post-war America should look like. I then weave in and out of those four companies for this 70-year arc. And one chapter in kind of the height of the social contract and America, in a way, and it's the height of the post-war golden age, takes place in 1955 in Rochester. And it's very much what you're talking about. And I talk about what a boom town it was. It was such a boom town because of Kodak. It was known as Smug Town USA. Okay, that's how much it was just rolling in dough. And its, and it's Kodak workers were rolling in money. George Eastman in 1912 had created something called the wage dividend. And if you can imagine this, because again, CEOs had a different mentality. It was a we mentality. They thought in terms of balancing the interests of all their stakeholders, their share owners for sure, but also their workers, their customers, the communities they operated in. So they would pay a dividend. It was effectively a profit sharing to their workers. If, if our shareholders got a dividend, our workers should get a, get a dividend. And in today's dollars, this payout in 1955, then a record, it was like it was the week before spring started, and every Kodak worker got the equivalent of four thousand dollars. Okay, in today in today's dollars, B Rochester went bananas. Car dealers were selling cars. Appliance dealers were selling refrigerators. I think that's the only time it, someone has equated Rochester with excitement. Yeah, but go ahead. It, it was it was crazy. So, so again, weaving in and out of these companies. The other interesting thing you see is that think about it. Two of those companies, so Kodak, you mentioned, went bankrupt, mm -hmm. right? Really never could embrace digital photography, even though it invented the digital camera, mm -hmm. never made it, went bankrupt. It's a shadow of itself now. Several thousand people work there in For, Rochester, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's tiny. Yeah. Um, uh, GM went bankrupt, right? So two real strugglers. And it's also a shadow. It's come back a long way, but it's a shadow of what it was. And then you have two other companies that, by and large, 
over this arc have done quite well. They've had their ups and downs, but in General Electric and Coca-Cola, they'd still rank at the top of anybody's list of successful companies. The really interesting thing to me is whether they were the two strugglers or the two that have been greatly successful, for their workers, it's all been the same story. So for all of them, they have far less job security than they did. They have uh, flat pay, certainly for their frontline workers. Many have w moved to two-tier wage structures where new workers are paid a pittance. Um, you've got certainly eroding health benefits with more and more of the costs put onto the shoulders of workers and their families. And you have very much eroding retirement security. But it did, and it didn't matter whether you were the good ones or the, or the companies that failed. So it sounds to me that not only do we have this erosion of security um, among the workers, but it sounds to me that the, these corporate titans created a world that, that promoted security at all costs, even at the cost of profit. Something that mm -hmm. you said uh, really reminded me, I, I just finished J. Paul Getty's How to Be Rich. Have you ever read that? I've never read that. Well, you, uh, you live in Los Angeles. Next time you get a chance, go to the Getty Museum. Yeah. They sell it at the, the gift shop. It's $7.95. Wow. It's paperback. Doesn't sound like you get rich selling that book. Uh, you right? know what? The yeah. funny thing was I bought it on a lark mm -hmm. because, you know, I had only heard bad things about J. Paul Getty. Um, besides, you know, the beautiful thing he built mm -hmm. for everyone and left yep. in perpetuity, but whatever. So um, the, the point was is I read it thinking that it was going to be about how to make money and like get rich quick. And what he's talking about is how to lead a rich life. Mm -hmm. And what, he, what he's saying, it's a very um, paternalistic book, mm -hmm. uh, chauvinistic. But he's saying that in order to be a stable, solid man, and I want to make it clear he was really directing it towards businessmen, you had to be versed in the arts. You had to understand mm -hmm. what was going on in news. You had to be, um, use your body. But more importantly, he said that if you're making money, you have to redistribute it. You have to mm. make sure that it gets into the hands of the middle class or else there's going to be great instability and the middle class is not going to have the money to buy your products, so whether in the case of him mm. it's petroleum or the Coca-Cola that they sell at the corner store. Yep. This, and I, I thought to myself that if someone, if a titan of business said this today, they'd be called a, a socialist. <laughs> um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, they would be denigrated that it is not that that is not the the way forward for this country that the the, the country it's profit at all costs yeah. am i am i wrong in thinking that do you think no i i don't so so that idea again that i mentioned that that there is concern now about secular stagnation that people there's just not enough consumer dollars flowing through the economy and it's hurting economic growth larry summers the former treasury secretary has talked a lot about this and that view that he held was very commonly held by business leaders, by many of them at that time. So, right, Henry Ford famously raised his workers' pay uh, from a dollar a day to five dollars a day like that. And the whole idea was, hey, I'm going to put enough money in their pockets, they can buy Fords. What a, what a cool thing. And it becomes this virtuous cycle. Um, in my book, you know, same, very much same idea. In 1944, Charlie Wilson, the president of General Electric, says, I got to put enough wages in my employees pockets so they can buy my refrigerators it's a pretty pretty simple idea so why why has that shifted and is there kind of a profit at all costs maybe even uh kind of killing the goose that's laying the golden egg i think there's a lot to that and here's why so if you look at why did the social contract unravel and again seen through the lens of these companies i look at a whole host of forces i i as a historian i really believe there's never one answer. Uh, history's messy, it's always a confluence of things. Sometimes things are running counter. It's, it's, it's not neat and tidy. But the big forces that I see that have, have caused the social contract to unravel are um, automation. Uh, and certainly we're, that's, a, that's a hot topic now as AI and machine learning and all this stuff accelerates. Um, trade and globalization. And I should say I'm not a Luddite and I think Technology is great, and it will ultimately it should help expand the pie. And if the pie is carved up right, that's a good thing. I'm not a protectionist, but certainly some communities have been very hard hit by by trade and globalization. I want to stop you just for a second yeah. because you use the word luddite, which that word is derived from essentially a worker strike that happened yep. in England yep. because people were worried about yep. automation, the very yep. thing that you're talking about. Yep. Again, we saw the same instability yep. that we see now and that we saw before the the scope of your book. Yep. 
Yeah, so yeah, these tra- look, these trends are not new. And again, you see them play out, in my case, over a 70-year arc, and many go back further. But, but the simple fact is, on automation, what in the 1950s you needed 1,000 people in a factory to make, you can now make with fewer than 200. Right, on, on average. You're talking about for automobiles. No, I'm talking about in sort of, I mean, there's a Fed study that, yeah. that looked at sort of manufacturing in general, which okay. 1,000 people now takes 185 or something, you know, something like that through, through the system. So trade, automation, the decline of unions, um, mm. and we can talk about why that happened, um, a little bit self-inflicted, mostly employer-inflicted, mm. uh, in my judgment. Um, this shift from... Uh, kind of a blue collar economy in many ways to knowledge work, where again, good for, the, good for knowledge workers, not so good if you don't have post-secondary education. Those are now low wage service workers. Um, they, those are the folks feeling left behind. So you have, all, you have all of those big shifts, the fracturing of work into more and more temp jobs, independent jo- contractors, gig jobs, and so on. You have all those forces. So that's all going on. And then the great, to me, if that's burning the gasoline on the fire, is the big cultural shift in corporate America, which is we've gone from this stakeholder model, I'm going to balance the interests of all my constituencies, including my workers, to a maximizing shareholder value model. And that has sort of was born in the mid-1970s and has accelerated greatly since then. And once you as an organization, as a CEO and as a board and as a company, explicitly say that shareholders are at the top of the pecking order, by definition, everybody else is going to get less, including workers. And if you look at the way the pie, which again has been growing over time, is divided, it's not divided like it used to be. Labor is getting less and capital investors are getting more. The rich are getting richer. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no question about that. And CEO pay is now very explicitly bound up in, in that. And we can talk about all that. But that's, to me, that's the gasoline on the fire. Uh, I want to go back to the book just for a moment because you profile Coca-Cola. You mentioned that uh, Coca-Cola is a company for uh, those of you who might not know. They're based in Atlanta. They've been based in Atlanta for a long time. Um, and they effectively franchise most of their, their bottling operations mm-hmm. out. So a family could come in at a, a different place and uh, make a good living bottling Coca-Cola. And their, their workers could, could make a good living. Um, Coca-Cola is one of the most interesting companies to me because I used to live in Atlanta and they have a history at one time, Birmingham and Atlanta were essentially, uh, economic counterweights. They were the, uh, essentially the same economic size. They were on the same economic trajectory. Um, you know, there were, there was the same kind of hope for both of them. And Birmingham went the way of segregation. They embraced their segregation under George Wallace, but but and Atlanta was going to as well. There was there was evidence that Atlanta was headed toward to reinforce segregation. This was of course the home of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, they didn't because Coca Cola intervened. Mm-hmm. Coca Cola said, "If you go this way, we are going to leave." That shows the power of a corporation during this time, which I'm using to illustrate. However, this time of civil rights access whether it's integration in Atlanta or equal pay in Rochester caused a lot of problems in the social contract between the worker and the company. Yeah, so um, so I would say, first of all, the history of Coke and race is really messy. Um, And some of it's- I'm not trying to make them sound like they're unaltruistic. And and some of it's it's really ugly. Um, And Robert Woodruff, who was Was, known as the boss, he he controlled Coca-Cola um, through his share ownership and, uh, and his, his family's ownership of Coke shares and headed the uh, executive committee um, of the company um, and, and effectively ran it. Even if he wasn't CEO, he ran Coca-Cola. Um, and he did. He, I don't know if he threatened to leave, but he basically said, we can't have a kind of world-class company in a, in a city where um, people are going to think of it as racist, and he did begin to change some of those practices. He also, again, he said some things over his yeah, time, all of it documented yeah. in the book that I won't repeat here, but are really ugly, and, um, you know, it's a reflection of his probably time and place and, and, and racism, I mean, and, and... He was a racist. So yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated story in Coca-Cola's case. Um, 
I tell some of that, but the, the chapter in my book where I talk about people of color and women entering the workforce um, in, in greater and greater numbers, but really accelerating through the 1960s, I actually set that chapter again in Rochester and around a, um, uh, a battle between the black community in Rochester and Kodak. Um, and all of these companies, I should say, hired very few African Americans um, in, into the 60s um, and very few women. Um, and, and I detail the struggles for them to break into these companies. I have to say that I was pretty, um, maybe shocked is a little strong, but it was pretty um, awful to just see the level of sexism and racism that existed in big corporations then, just how blatant it was, the language that they used. Um, it, it's, it, and you know, not very long ago. And I'll look, obviously, a lot of that still goes on today. So I don't mean to suggest it's all fixed now. It's, it is not by any means. Um, but it was pretty shocking to see companies at least so explicit about it. Um, really, really kind of terrible. And, and then my conclusion in this chapter is by the 60s, people of color, women did start to enter the workforce in greater and greater numbers. But the way I describe it is um, first they, were, they got into the party, but they were put at the worst table because they still faced tremendous discrimination in terms of their pay um, and the way they were treated. And the party was about to you know, come crashing down anyway because this was when the social contract began to unwind. And you know, it, you, you write that, and by the, yep. the time they belonged and the bash was about to come to an end. Yes. Um, which brings me to the last question before we go to audience questions. Uh -huh. um, going back... The, the idea that this party's ended and going to the yep. the rise and fall of good jobs in America. Um, you said that these were jobs that uh, were done in factories. They offered a path to the middle class. Um, I'm thinking that during the same time, when we say good jobs, we're talking about good jobs for white men. During, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, and I make that point. There, yeah, is, yeah, definitely yeah. An as, there is definitely an asterisk about the golden age. It was not... As, as noted, not, not golden for people of color, not golden for women. So is, yes. the, is the concern, uh, as, as you look through this lens of history, is the concern that for everybody now, um, there is not this kind of path from the lower uh, socioeconomic rungs to uh, some type of upward mobility? Or is the concern that there is not this path for white men? Does, it, does that make sense what I'm saying? Like, I'm wondering if the concern is my concerns for everybody. So right, right, right. But it seems that our our concern lately, as there has been a lot of talk in the media. Yes. For example, I, I work at a national public radio station, and we talk a lot about the return of coal mining jobs and the yeah. the <laughs> the uh, the return of these these jobs where they're they're kind of romanticized. They, they are they are greatly romanticized. So they're I, romanticized so by white men. Is my point. Yeah. Like, I don't hear too many women saying, "I want to go back to the days where I could be a cleaner or a secretary." Right, right. So, so let, let me say a couple of quick things before we before we open it up. So, one is, um, and and I really do feel genuinely for these communities. They have been left behind. But the coal mining jobs, whatever our president says, they're not coming back. I mean, the the market, you know, those are market forces. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> market <laughs> forces have have long left that you know station. It's down the track. Th those jobs are not coming back. It also, again, and I feel for all those people, there's an inordinate amount of attention paid. I mean, it's, you're talking about some 60 to 80,000 jobs. It's just not a lot of jobs in the scheme of things. We pay an awful lot of attention. The miners always think you could put all, every coal miner in the Rose Bowl and still have seats left over. Okay, so it's like it's not that many jobs. So we can move past the coal miners. Uh, my concern is for everybody. There mm -hmm. is a particular concern that is worth noting um, for men which is, you know, that more and more men, um, often because a lot of the past they had to the middle class and to take care of their families, have disappeared because of all the forces that I cited, right? There is now a very historically high number of working age men in particular, mid-20s to mid-50s, who have taken themselves out of the labor force altogether, mm -hmm. who are on the sidelines, right? You probably have read a lot about and this. And we're seeing a lot of them, um, and I just I was talking about this uh, recently with someone else, uh, another expert. We're seeing a lot of them uh, enter the uh, the opiate crisis. They're, Absolutely. They're, they're going, uh, yep. and we're also seeing, and this was something I found very um, interesting. I, I saw a study recently um, and I think it was from Stanford, but don't quote me on that, uh, that showed that 
more men were playing video games yes, into their yes. into their their mid thirties, and they and therefore they weren't looking for jobs because they essentially were allowed to stay at their parents' house and play video games. Yeah, I'm not sure that's why they're there, but 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 yes, there's definitely research that suggests that's at least what many of them are doing but to they occupy talked, their time. But yes. they talked about the psychology of of because there weren't whatever for whatever reasons there weren't this this pathway in the middle. Yep, they were creating this right. alternate well, that, reality online. Yeah, that, um, I, I'm not a psychologist. Sure, so, sure, yeah, sure, but, sure. But, but, but I think the larger point is very true. Those, those kind of middle jobs are disappearing. There's a lot of low-end jobs that, may, that some people just don't think are worth their time and may not be worth their time. Um, they're getting paid so little. And, and remember, we're now in a country that somewhere 40 to 45% of wage earners are making less than $25,000 a year. Half of wage earners are making less than thirty thousand dollars a year. Now, obviously, in a place like San Francisco, that does not, you know, go <laughs> go anywhere. But even in rural, it can get you wherever, a really that's nice, just not a lot. That's not a lot of. That can get you well, a nice closet in South San Francisco. There, okay, there yeah. you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, the one, the last thing I'll say about this, which is, I actually think there's an opportunity here. The the focus on the white working class from policymakers, from scholars, from politicians in and particular, the media. And the media. Uh, yeah, and the media, um, that maybe that's an opportunity. Communities of color have been suffering with these problems for a long, long time. When factories first began to pull out in the 70s and 80s in America, you know, the term is deindustrialized. A lot of that was in black neighborhoods, um, in inner cities. Those communities have suffered for a long time, and a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, pathologies and, and things that have, you know, sort of taken root in those communities. It's because there's not work. There's not enough good jobs. If we're now seeing that in, you know, kind of white communities um, that are seeing the same thing, maybe one, it'll help all of us realize that, you know, so many people in the same boat and stop pointing fingers. That's them. That's not us. Um, realize there's actually a lot in common and a lot to struggle and, and push for together. And maybe politicians who really didn't pay much attention to communities of color will pay more attention now um, and help lift everybody. So maybe there's a little silver lining in it. I hope so. Historically, uh, we me I mentioned the Luddites, but when these types of gross inequities happen, historically what happens within a society? You know, lanterns and pitchforks, um, honestly. I mean... I, I really think that you know you're you're seeing signs of social unrest in this country, obviously. So and whatever your political flavor, you know, I, I said this to students earlier, right? It to me, it's all a manifestation of the same thing. There's little trust in institutions, including business. Um, I, I think uh, you know whether you come from a Tea Party perspective or an Occupy Wall Street perspective, whether you are a Bernie bro or a Trump, you know, person, you know, there's certainly, you know, that was actually uh, the uh, technical uh, term, Trump <laughs> person. <laughs> that that uh, that there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of anxiety. And the one thing that I am seeing little bits of of again glimmers of of that give me some hope. More and more CEOs, I think, are waking up to this fact. Um, there are little there are little signs of it. So I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples real quick. One is Fortune magazine last year took a group of Fortune 500 CEOs to the Vatican to talk about what is our role in sharing prosperity more broadly. Now you can say it was all PR, although it wasn't a big you know event that got a lot of PR attention. They met with Pope Francis. They had working groups. They really started to try and at least think through this, have a conversation about this. And they sort of defined the need to share prosperity more broadly as the defining social issue of our time. Um, I'm pretty cynical, but I can't even imagine that conversation happening in the 80s or 90s, hmm. okay? I think that there is some concern, growing concern among CEOs of large companies that the current system is unsustainable. There, there was a poll last year out of Harvard, some of you may have seen, that more than half of young people don't believe in capitalism, okay? Now, if I were a Fortune 100 CEO, that would scare the oomph out of we're me. We're getting really high numbers, too, that also believe that an authoritarian way of government yep. is, I mean, there's a yes. lot, especially for under 30. I exactly, it's, it's and those are all different sides of the same coin, again, right, you right. know, depending on how you think this problem needs to be solved. 
And so, and, and look, and Trump is clearly a manifestation of, of this. His messaging largely around, I can bring back these jobs, I can, I'm um, for the working class. He's going to stop the American carnage. And so, yeah, yeah. there, there yeah. you go. So, I, you know, look, I think it was all a big bait and switch, but it's, it's, uh, it's what he in large part won on. So, And his supporters, you know, scary. We, we spoke, uh, the World Affairs Council um, recently had uh, Arlie Hochschild. Yeah. And she talked about this idea that uh, a lot of Trump supporters, and I just want to be fair to them, um, you know, some people might say it's a bait and switch. Others felt that Trump was putting them back in, in their place in the line, that um, they felt that other people had cut in front of them in the line. Um, you say that good jobs, this is from an audience question now, you say that good jobs and the ability to rise from a factory worker or a truck driver to manager has more or less disappeared um, in the 1980s onwards. Why would you say such a shift occurred? So, first of all, I don't want to overstate the ability before to rise from factory floor to manager, although that did happen in GM plants, for example. It wasn't uncommon to go from a frontline person to a foreman. Um, and again, in a Coca-Cola plant, it certainly wasn't uncommon to go from uh, a delivery route salesperson who was schlepping big, you know, crates of Coca-Cola to man to have some managerial supervisory role in the factory. Um, so, so there were those paths. One of the things that has happened is that um, a lot of those uh, sorts of jobs again need higher education. Um, so, most managers now you need an MBA, frankly, if you're going to certainly get to a, a, a certain level. I tell this story through Coca-Cola actually, um, and I focus on a. Uh, a bottling uh, operation in Boston um, where a guy had risen his whole, he, has, he had worked there multiple generations of his family, a guy named Bill Mayako. Um, and he had risen through the system. He started as a truck driver. He had become a manager. The other piece of the story is that Roberto Goizueta, the then CEO of Coca-Cola, he was a big maximizing shareholder value guy. And these were company-owned bottling operations where this guy, Bill Miyako, happened to work. So part of being able to uh, maximize shareholder value was to squeeze more and more profit out of the bottlers. So how do you do that? Well, you bring in professional MBAs who can wring out every efficiency in the plant. And so part of that was a guy like Bill Miyako didn't stand a chance. He was like a guy who would come up as a truck driver. He made a lot of decisions based on kind of gut and experience. Um, now you had people coming in who looked at KPIs, key performance indicators, and who were very numbers driven and metrics driven. Um, the whole, it, it got professionalized. And guys like Bill Miyako got washed out. Bill Miyako actually, somebody came in, as he recalled, he said it was some young guy with a PhD. I don't think he probably had a PhD, probably had an MBA. And he said, I was asked to train him. And then the next thing you know, that guy replaced him. It seems to me that the, what we're really talking about when is, is trust um, at, the, at its core. Mm -hmm. Bill trusted Coca-Cola that if Bill did the right thing and Bill was there for the company, the company would be there for them. And at some point that shifted and the company stopped being there for them. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds like people stopped being there for the company. Yep. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, is that oversimplified? Yeah. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, and again, if, if you, you know, look at a company like Coca-Cola and all of these others, I mean, Jack Welch, Roberto goes away to Jack Welch, the CEO of G. of GE, who, and they came in about the same time and, and goes away to died actually um, in the late 90s when he was CEO. Um, again, they were both so, you know, shareholder focused. And when you do that, suddenly employees, right, every executive says, oh, my people are my greatest asset. Um, <laughs> very few treat them that way. They actually, they look at employees when you're trying to drive, drive stock price higher, when your own compensation depends on it being driven higher, because now, depending on what study you look at, most big company CEOs, their compensation is anywhere from 50 to 80% tied to stock price, and often short-term stock price. So if I can drive the stock up in the short term, I'm going to get paid a lot more. Well, how do I drive the stock up in the short term? I raise profits. How do I do that? I cut costs. Cut, cut, cut. So suddenly, employees look like costs. They don't look like assets. They look like an avoidable expense. 
And there is no question that that is what's happened through corporate America. Avoidable expenses. College is ridiculously expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying that most uh, people have to have an MBA at this point to kind of enter um, uh, uh, well, that, senior, that, tier, right, th that right. top, top tier. Um, That's right. What's, uh, the question comes from Dave. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to parents of teenagers uh, to prepare them from, for getting a good job in 10 years after they graduate from university? I think it's so interesting that Dave said this because, you know, 30 years ago, we might not have considered graduating from university. You could have gone to a technical or a trade school. Actually, the first school I went to was not a college. It was I went to be an auto mechanic because that seemed like a, a great middle-class job it still is and so I would actually say think about education broadly what all the data tells us is that what you need now to make it is you need a some kind of post-secondary education and you're gonna probably need to be trained and retrained through your entire career um, but you don't necessarily need a four-year college degree it's still by and large, even with all the debt, and there's some real questions about return on investment and, and all kinds of things, a four-year college degree, for those who want that, that's still a really good investment. It just is. Um, but it doesn't mean that to get a good job, you need that, but you need some kind of education. So you need a community college degree, or you need some kind of po you know, post-secondary technical certificate in, the skilled, in a skilled trades, in plumbing, in electrical, in automotive, in construction. Um, many of the jobs that are going to be created that pay well and that will be a good job, that's the level that you need. That's what all the Bureau of Labor Statistics data suggests, that all the, the experts suggest. What you can't do is have no education post high school or no skills. And we are now in a country where fewer, slightly fewer than half the adults in this country have a four-year degree, a two-year degree, or a post-secondary credential. So we're effectively those, that's the half really being left behind. And we don't, we haven't done a very good job of figuring out how to provide them with what they need to get on that path. Uh, this question comes from the audience. Why do you think return to shareholders and executives came to dominate uh, over return to workers, customers, communities, and shareholders? So I, I'd say sort of, I think, there, I think there are several reasons. One is, again, I think there was this great cultural shift from kind of a we ethic in America to more of an I ethic. And if you look at the rise of, the, of maximizing shareholder value, um, it's actually in, in the academic literature, it's called agency theory because corporate executives are supposed to be the agents of the shareholders. That's their sole responsibility is to make them money. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of scholars, and myself included in the book, trace the origins of this to a, a famous Milton Friedman, the University of Chicago economist, an essay he wrote in the New York Times Magazine in 1970, where he uh, expounded on, on uh, this, this agency theory. It was then picked up by uh, an academic, two academics actually, Michael Jensen and William Meckling, who were then at the University of Rochester. Jensen really pushed this. He went, ended up at Harvard. Um, and it all fit into a time where um, the marketplace, there was kind of this cool rationality to the marketplace. And the marketplace could solve all of our, our problems. The market solves all, everything. The market solves everything. And, you know, Ronald. Is that true? Ron, no, no, it is not. And Ronald, and, the, and you know, what's a pure marketplace? We can right. get into that. But, and Ronald Reagan sort of ran on this from a kind of government, you know, side of things. Right. So, so our culture changed. Our norms changed. That drove, that was a big driver. The other big driver is once this took root and boards and investors and the nature of investment changed, big institutional holders, uh, some of whom were pushing companies to, again, drive share price, drive share price. Um, the corporate raiders of, of that era, now there are many of the same people, I think, are called activists, you know, <laughs> investors. Well, it's not the activists were the nuns who showed up at shareholder <laughs> meetings. I feel like that term's been hijacked, you know. Anyway, those people were, were drive, pushing for a lot of these short-term gains. So once they tied CEO pay to, to short-term rises in stock, it's really hard to convince somebody to like undo something that's enriching them personally. So look at what happened to CEO pay. From the 1930s, for decades straight through, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 
If you look at average big company CEO pay adjusted for inflation, so we're talking apples to apples, it averaged about a million dollars a year for all of those decades. And it hardly changed. I've looked at the data. It fluctuates by about $50,000. I mean, it's literally, it's like a million bucks straight across. The 1980s, this new ethic takes hold and this new compensation system began, begins to kick in. Greed it is go good. The greed is good era, exactly. Yeah. Pay now doubles on average at these big companies for CEOs to $2 million. It doubles again in the 90s to $4 million. We're now at a point, depending on how you measure the stock, it's somewhere between 13 and $16 million on average. By the way, is greed good? Uh, not, you know, so maybe a little, uh, but not as much as we have now, no. Um, this comes from Harrison. I recently read that despite all the talk of rapid technological change, U.S. economic efficiency is actually increasing at the lowest rate in history. To what extent do you think current economic mm. woes are due to a lack of change, not too much of it? Really? What a good question. Um, so... Harrison I'm, is actually doing this next week. He's going to sit in this chair right now. All right, there. cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm not sure about, and I'm thinking about the word efficiency, um, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure about that. I think maybe, I, I think more in terms of productivity. So productivity growth has been very slow, right, which is output per hour of work, if you define as defined. Um, and there are a lot of concerns about productivity growth, and, and a lot of economists say, there is no truth to automation eating a lot of jobs because if it was true, productivity would be growing much faster. Um, mm. And so some others counter and say, no, the data is just not very good at picking up on a lot of technological gains, and there's a lot of economists who fight about this stuff. Robert Gordon is of Northwestern is the most prominent economist who wrote uh, a, a big book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth, I think, and, th and he he very much thinks that we are in a long-term, slow productivity growth era. This is a concern. So there are two concerns. One is without productivity growth, that's how you grow the economic pie. That's what makes our gross dom domestic product, our overall economic output, grow. Um, but the other factor is how is the pie divided? Okay. So even if the pie is growing, it's supposed to be divided upright. And as I said, labor is now get, not getting the share that it once did. So yes, productivity growth has slowed, um, but it's not not growing. And so if you actually look, um, productivity growth, if, if, peop, if labor was getting the share that it did from this post-war period, from the late 40s to the early 70s, if they were getting as big a slice um, since then as they were in the earlier period, the person now making $40,000 a year would be making $61,000 a year, okay? Where's all that other money going? It's going to- Not to me, I don't know. <laughs> it's going to investors, largely. Mm -hmm. That is where it's going. It's not like companies are plowing it back into R&D or buying new stuff. It's going to investors, largely through dividends, through higher CEO pay, and through big share buybacks to I, try and goose the stock higher. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I have heard recently that actually R&D is also at a, a like proportionately a low level yep. in, a, in American corporations. Yep. Is that true, too? Yes. Yes. Huh? So, yeah, there's not, there is not, there is... So, there's not that reinvestment in research and development, which often kind of kept big companies going. Correct. There's right. a lot, and a lot of this, again, a lot of folks who look at this worry about this short-term mindset that companies have adopted, largely driven by this maximizing shareholder value ethos. And, and, if you, and if you think about it, there's more and more investor pressure, right? You want to drive things up in the short term. In the 1960s, the, uh, the average was that an investor held stock for eight years, a share of stock. Now it's eight months, right? Hmm. So the money's flying around faster. The pressure's on to do things faster. It's hard to say, hey, you know what? we are going to you know, take more time and invest the right way. Um, the CEO of Ford just got canned after record earnings because he wasn't returning enough to shareholders um, and wanted to invest more for the future in the company, in R&D. And there was a lot of activist investor pressure, and he got fired. They want their money. They want their money now, absolutely. Well, we have about 10 minutes in the program, uh, and I wanna really want to spend where you see the future uh, headed. So I'm going to ask you, I know uh, people who specialize in research don't like to often play the part of, of profit, but 
you know, I've been talking to people and there's three things that kind of uh, touch on, on, on this subject. One is there's this feeling I, I'm getting from a lot of people of just a sense in their gut that things are not good. That's the first thing, uh, kind of like an unrest. The second thing is there's a concern, like we heard, uh, I believe it was from Dave, uh, that their children are going to have to work a lot harder to get to the same spot they were, if that's even possible. Um, and the third is there's this great, besides the, the feeling that, that uh, there's no, maybe not, the, uh, not a lot of optimism and this concern for their, their children, there's also this feeling that um, there's a, a big shift coming. And what, even if they're, they're not necessarily cynical about it, they're very unsure of it. So there's this unease, um, this concern for their kids, and then in many people this, this kind of thing in the, their stomach that things just aren't right. Um, yep. <laughs> do, uh, I'm glad I summed it up. That's it, everyone? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> with that, do you, so you agree with that, obviously. What does that mean for us in the context um, of the economy based on what you've seen? Where do you see us? Yeah. So, I, you know, I worry obviously a lot about this and, and, and where we're headed. I, I don't think it's sustainable. Um, I think that, again, we're seeing signs of social unrest. I mean, I think Donald Trump is a sign of, of social unrest that, you know, even if he didn't win a majority of the vote, 60 million, you know, Plus, people voted for him. He I, would I, have know. won a majority mm -hmm. if it wasn't just for all the illegal. Was, yes, there exactly. was a lot of illegal it, it, voting. It, it, yeah, well, yeah, there was exactly. a, there was, And if he <laughs> wanted to focus on the popular vote, he would have. That's much more difficult, yeah, by the way. Yeah, he yeah. said that. He yeah. tweeted that. There you go. That makes it true. <laughs> so, yeah, I, look, I, I take that as a sign of social unrest. I, I think we're in for more social unrest unless we unless we fix this. Business does not do well in social unrest unless you're selling you know, guns. That is very true. There's a great, so right from the Drucker Institute, there's a wonderful Peter Drucker quote I actually have at the end of my book, which is that a healthy business cannot exist in a sick society. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. And, and again, I think that some companies are starting to wake up to this. So I will, so I'll give you, I'll give you sort of, sort of two answers. One answer is that um, all of the forces I write about in my book are not going away, and many of them are accelerating, um, particularly things like automation um, and the pressures of, of automation and, and technology. I don't think robots are going to eat all of our jobs. I think we'll, lots of new jobs will be created. But I do think that lots of the most vulnerable, those without skills, those without enough education, those who are doing repetitive tasks, those are the people who are going to get replaced. You know, think truck drivers, right? So those folks who are already really struggling are just going to be even worse off, which is going to lead to more social unrest. Um, the, the glimmer, and again, I'm not even half fool, but the glimmer is that, and, and the reason to think maybe we've either hit bottom of these trends or, or are close, is that there are definitely more um, business executives who I think see this as unsustainable and are beginning to, to think about it. The biggest shift, um, probably in all of this, is in, is in Walmart. Um, really interesting company to be watching right now. Biggest employer in America, U.S. employment, 1.2 million people. Um, it's also had a, a string of hard times for Walmart, yeah. comparatively, from where they were during the, the beginning of the millennium. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think, you know, but they have made a strategic shift. Now, I don't think they have done enough for their low, primarily low-wage workforce, and uh, I think there's more to do, and I think they, and there are some, some problems. But they are no longer a minimum wage employer. They have made a strategic decision about that. So starting pay and, their, and you know, their stores across the country has gone from minimum wage to, you know, I think you actually start around nine bucks, but you quickly can get to like 10 bucks an hour, and their average wage is now close to 13 and a half dollars an hour. Hmm. Um, that's still it's, poverty wages. It's still poverty wages. It's not, it's not great. And, they're, and they have a lot of part-time workers who aren't even making that. Their wage structure is uneven. There's a lot of problems that they're now having with scheduling um, their workers, a lot of complaints from the front lines about that. So I'm not holding them up like, man, they've really fixed everything. But they have made a strategic decision that we can, we have to, we, we've done a lot on the environmental side, which, envi which Walmart actually has, and I think they've figured out there's a good return on investment in that. Right, you use less fuel. You have 
lower packaging costs. There's a lot of like ROI on, on ha being more responsible on the environmental side. They are starting to try and figure out, is there an ROI on the people side? And the fact that they're even looking at that and more companies are looking at that is, is, a, good, is a good thing. L let me just say a couple last quick things, which is- And, and I mm -hmm. just want to re yeah, yeah. recap just for our radio audience. Yep. You're essentially saying that if Walmart can learn these things, other companies can learn these a things. Absolutely, and also Walmart is so big in terms of the low-wage economy that it influences a lot of other retailers and other low-wage employers. Um, it's an interesting sign, this conversation, you know, that Fortune held with these CEOs, which is going to continue, by the way, under something called the CEO Initiative um, that Fortune is and Time Inc. are, are putting together. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's a conversation, but it's, an, it's interesting. There are pressure points now coming in ways um, because of technology that are helpful. So um, uh, there's a lot more data that we all can get now and that investment funds are getting. So socially responsible investing, which is now largely focused on the environmental side, right? More and more of it, I think, is going to shift to also try and say, if you want to invest in companies that treat their workers well, all the way down to the front lines, provide a living wage, provide some training, have good working conditions, um, you'll know where to put your dollars. And that, is it a huge movement? No, but one in five dollars now invested uh, under management in the U.S., about nine trillion dollars. It's not nothing. Um, that's now being managed with some socially responsible investing strategy in mind. That's an interesting force. Um, are the capital markets, you know, suddenly not trying to maximize shareholder value? No. But again, these are undercurrents that are starting to shift in the other direction. The last thing I'll say is, is as employer, as employees, all these bright young people in the room with us, I know that they, just from their questions they were asking me before the program, but certainly other college audience I've talked to, if you're lucky enough to have choice about where you work, more and more young people want to work at companies that share their values. They don't want to go work for a, uh, an employer that treats its frontline people badly. They want to work for a place that's trying to do good in the world. And same thing as consumers. There are more and more tools that we have that, that whether it's Glassdoor or Payscale, there's an online bank called Aspiration where you can peek in and see where you're spending your dollars, what merchants you go to, you pay with your debit card, you do your online bill paying through this bank. You can then check on the app and it'll give you a people score and a planet score for where you're shopping. And it'll also put it in context. Is that, a, is that a crummy company or a good company? And do I want to spend my dollars there? These are, these are powerful forces that are bubbling, bubbling yeah it sounds I, I i get that first of all if that is your optimistic pitch i'm still crestfallen um that's the best i got <laughs> <right>. man <laughs> nothing, nothing personal um the, that's the best i got the but I, when i think of things like this app i'm thinking we live in this permanently divided like i'm gonna vote with my dollars um therefore i'm only gonna shop at places that are like-minded i'm only gonna live in places that are like-minded i'm only gonna and and part of it was this idea that there was a, a greater integration um, mm. during during this time that you write about. I'm not talking yep. about racially. I'm talking about socioeconomically and, and beliefs. Um, yep. The last question I want to leave you with, because the specter of automation, and I think you have about three minutes to answer it, so lucky you, um, is really about this idea. Because one of the, la the one of the last things I want you to focus on, you said that part of having a good job is having the sense of fulfillment and pride. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a hard time finding, and I want to make this clear, um, with no disrespect to Walmart workers, but we don't, as a society, look highly upon retail workers. Nope. Um, we don't look highly often upon truck drivers and, and these these types of mm -hmm. entry points. Yep. W what, what needs to change? Um, so, well, let me ask you this. If automation takes over, mm -hmm. uh, how will people view themselves if we are essentially jobless? Yeah, I, again, so I, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to be jobless, um, first of all. Um, so, so I think there, there are a bunch of quick answers to that. One is we do need to recognize that people going into any number of occupations um, – uh, that may be stigmatized right now really shouldn't be. We, again, we talked, I talked about this with the students. So I'm a big believer that we need a great bolstering of what's now used to be vocational education, right, now right. career and technical education, right. um, particularly in the skilled trades, right? You started out in, 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 in mechanic school. In, yeah. in mechanic school. Um, 
to me, that's not like it. That traditionally has been like, you know, the quote unquote dumb kids are tracked there. Um, that's, that was the case of my case. Yeah, 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 yes. And so that is, <laughs> yes. And that, is, and that, but that is in a lot of cases the way it's stigmatized. I've spent a lot of time with those students and their teachers, and that's just a different form of intelligence. We need to celebrate it as a different form of intelligence. Um, people who are really good at retail, um, I mean good at it in kind of a concierge way. When you have a good service experience, those are people who are often, whatever store you're in, they have a lot of empathy, they have good people skills. They're, they're great of, on the upsell. They're kind of, you know they're, good, I mean? they're great yeah. on the upsell, yeah. exactly. They're high touch. Um, that's a whole form of intelligence and, and set of skills. So, you know, I hope over time, and those are often the, the elements of a job that can't be automated, actually. So caregiving is a really good one. We pay those workers terrible, terrible. And then we're asking them, by the way, take care of our kids and take care of my elderly, you know, mom. Why do we, why do, we do that? Why do we then pay them minimum wage? A question we'll have to ponder as we leave this program. Rick Wartzman, everyone. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks.